welcome everyone to this session. I'm Nicola Draghi, and together with my colleague, Mike Casanovas simo we are going to present uh, this call annual statistics session, first with the, this presentation and then with the exercises. So let's start with a review of the sector. You see here two uh, pie charts. On the left side, we have void total energy supply, and on the right side, the void electricity generation, both for uh, 2021. So uh, here we want to highlight the relevance of uh, coal compared to other sources. On the left side, we see that coal is the second largest source of energy, just behind oil and in front of natural gas. Whereas when we speak about electricity generation, we see that coal in 2021 was by far the largest source of electricity generation. Again, in front of natural gas, but natural gas had a much smaller um, share and then many other fuels. So uh, coal is a major player in both energy supply and electricity generation, but the relative share is quite different between the two. Moving on to coal production and its evolution from country to country over time, uh, you can see here uh, this figure, this chart that comes from our coal animal statistics published in the coal information 2023 report last summer. So uh, let's look that more in detail, maybe with the help of a laser point, we see that in the 80s, coal production increased, was flat in the 90s. Then please have a look also at China graph over here. And you see that the trend of uh, coal production mimic very much the one of China. So the expansion in China production was very much the driver for this increase in the 2000s. And then the trend is more volatile in 2010s with the flat down and some increases and decreases we see here 2020 for the COVID pandemic and um, so on. So in terms of main producers on the right side, we see that China is by far the biggest producer followed by the OECD as an aggregate. But in terms of uh, um, single countries, we have India and Indonesia uh, following. And uh, they are also two of the fastest uh, rising producers in relative terms, India in, in uh, Indonesia. And we see that also very importantly in 2022 uh, preliminary figures, we have a big increase in coal production following the one in 2021. In 2022 was about 8%. Moving to consumption, the trend is uh, very similar. Now the graph is in energy terms, in exajoules, but uh, the trend is basically the same follows the one of uh, production. And here, one of all, I want to focus directly on the main consumers. And we see that China accounts for more than half of total coal consumption in the world. You see that in uh, light blue, that this is all the chunk of consumption belonging to China. Then with the India, which is the second biggest country, they uh, amount to about two thirds of the overall um, consumption. And then we have United States and OECD as an aggregate again at the second uh, at the second place. Similarly to production, also consumption increased again in 2022, uh, but just uh, a little bit less, 3.7%. On the trade side, uh, this time OECD as an aggregate is the main uh, exporter and it's followed by Indonesia, which is then the biggest exporting country in the in the world. And then we have Australia and the Russian Federation. So OECD is at the top, mostly thanks to Australia and United States, whereas Indonesia has been growing very much in recent years and uh, overcome uh, Australia indeed, uh, indeed uh, recently. What to notice here is that similarly to production and consumption, also for exports, we have a handful of countries that account for the vast majority of them. Uh, when talking about imports, China and India that are respectively in light and dark blue are again the two largest coal importers in uh, 2022. We saw that they are also very big consumers and be a very big uh, producer. However, I wanna uh, just show you the trend for 2022. 
contrary to the year before, in 2022, we see a reduction in China imports for now, uh, preliminary figures, and we see instead a bounce in India imports so that the gap between the two countries is uh, less. We see an increase also in gray for the EU um, imports, of which the Germany is the uh, highest importing country and, uh, and uh, increase by 10% its imports. And OECD uh, as a aggregate, it's the biggest importing region, let's say, thanks this time to is uh, Asian countries as Japan and Korea. Now let's move to some key concepts and we start with product classification. And this is because primary coal is a very heterogeneous uh, product. And so in order to classify them, coal types, uh, here speaking about primary coal, can be distinguished by their physical and chemical characteristics. We then determine their suitability for certain uses and their prices. On the left side, then you can see the classification according to uh, the physical and chemical characteristics. And in general, the higher content of carbon, the higher the quality, and higher run coal have also less moisture and volatile matter, and therefore better qualities for the metallurgical sector, for example. So on the left, we see hard coal over here, including cooking coal, anthracite, and other bituminous coal, and brown coal, including sub-bituminous coal and lignite. And for example, if we look at calorific value, we see, the, we see that hard coal have always a calorific value above 20, 24,000 kilojoule per kilogram, whereas for brown coal, we go below that, uh, uh, that threshold. On the right side, we see that um, uh, coal products can be classified also by, by the use. For example, we have metallurgical coal, so cooking coal, that has such a high quality that make it suitable, high quality and characteristics that make it suitable to be fed into cook ovens, so for the metallurgical uh, sector. Then we have anthracite, other bituminous coal and sub-bituminous coal, which are used mostly for electricity production, so they're called steam coal, so to produce steam, steam coal or thermal coal, and lignite, which is used, um, which is excluded from this classification and has various uh, uses, among which also for electricity production. So until now, we mostly talked about coal, primary coal we saw before, but um, this whole section of energy statistics at the IA is called solid fossil fuels and manufactured gases because includes more fuels, other fuels, so uh, a broader concept, let's say. And these are all the 17 fuels that we collect in this, uh, um, in this section of, uh, of energy statistics. Uh, they are indeed solid fossil fuels, and we have primary fuels that are the one that can be found in the nature, can be harnessed or um, just mined from the biosphere. Uh, whereas we have on the right side derived solid products and manufactured gases, which instead are the result of a, of a transformation process. Here in this slide, even more, again divided on the left side, primary coal. In the middle, you have, let me take it with a laser pointer. Here we go. In the middle, you have um, derived solid products. And on the right side, you have manufactured gases. So you can read, obviously, this atom. We have all the definition here online on the questionnaire reporting instruction. But uh, what is very important here is that very often, actually always, um, secondary products, so the products which are manufactured or comes from transformation, derives from primary products. So when you know the interrelationship between products, you can often guess whether there is an output or an input that has been reported correctly or not, or you can estimate one or the other. For example, if we look at the uh, orange boxes and orange arrows, we can see that cooking coal, which is used in coke ovens, has as a product of the transformation, cocoa oven cook, coal tar, and cocoa oven gas. And then cocoa oven cook can be further used in blast furnaces to produce blast furnace gas and sometimes also other recovery gases. So it's very important to this slide to get the interconnection between, uh, between products. 
Now let's move to the call balance and let's look at it through a simplified flowchart going from left to right. We have production, which happens uh, mostly into uh, mines, surface, or underground. But for secondary products, for derived core products, we have production from transformation processes. And then we, we can have also production from other sources, which is very uh, peculiar processes, or when the production happens in another, um, from another fuel, so from another section of, uh, uh, of annual statistics. And then the consumption of these products uh, goes back into the coal and solid fossil fuels and manufactured gases uh, section. Then we have import and export, so trade and stock draw and stock build. You see that the arrows sometimes point to this line, sometimes goes out because import and export have a different uh, um, sign. So they can add quantities to the supply side or take out quantities of, from the supply side. Then we have transformation, where indeed we see uh, all the processes where coal is transformed into another fuel, uh, um, into another energy forms, for example, electricity, but also into another fuel, for example, a derived coal products. Energy industry of, on use, that is when coal products are used for energy purposes to provide energy to the above mentioned transformation processes or to the other energy industry um, uses. And then we have total final consumption that can be energy consumption or non-energy use when, for example, coal is used as a feedstock. Finally, distribution losses, which happen during the distribution transmission um, of coal, or for example, for gases, if those are vented. Let's look at the most important flows, starting from uh, production, which occurs in mines. And the most common process is surface mining, because that's less expensive than underground. Now, what is important here is that production includes, um, so production, uh, accounts for the quantity of coal which is produced, but after any operation of removal of uh, the ionite matter or anything else. So uh, we report in production the coal which is already clean and marketable. But also very importantly, production includes the quantity of coal which is consumed by the producer. For example, some quantity of coal is burnt to provide energy for the equipment running the, the mine. So that account of coal, that amount of coal, is accounted on the supply side on the on production and on the demand side on energy industry on use into the mine uh, sector. Then we move to trade. And uh, indeed, coal is a very tradable product because it's easily transported over long distances, either by boat or train. And here, it's very important to set boundaries to statistics, to coal statistics. So imports is coal which enter the country for domestic supply and demand, so for use within the country. Export instead is coal which has been produced domestically and that is living the country. And if, you, if we follow this definition, we see that transit trade is excluded, which is, for example, that if a country imports a quantity of coal, doesn't do anything with this coal, but just export it right after, then this amount shouldn't be included into the uh, into the trade uh, records. So below you see for country A, B, and C some uh, some scenarios. Um, there can be uh, other things happening, other situation. So this reporting is not super easy. So we invite all the country from which we collect data to communicate with us and discuss with us if there is uh, some something not clear or if there is a particular situation and we can sort it out together. Then uh, going into the transformation side, there is a wide variety of transformation processes and plants. Starting from the top, you see the most common one in orange, and it's the transformation of coal products, uh, primary and secondary, into electricity and heat to electricity and heat plants. Then we have the various uh, transformation from a coal product usually a primary product into a secondary product. So we see cocovens before, blast furnaces, gas works gas, but there are also others, for example, for uh, BKB to create uh, briquettes or for patent fuels and so on. And then we have also the possibility to 
uh, move from coal and transform into other energy products, as the case of oil products into in coal liquefaction plants. Let me look at an example of transformation, a very common one, uh, which is uh, coke ovens, where cooking coal is subject to a process of carbonization, meaning simply that it's heated at high temperature in an oxygen-free atmosphere. And I wanna, sorry, I wanted to zoom into here and show you that the input in C, in, indeed is cooking coal and the main output is cook oven cook, so output number one, but there are also byproducts of uh, this process and uh, they are output number two, cook oven gas and coal tar, that can be further reused in some cases to provide energy to sustain the reaction into the cook ovens. So it's very important then to calculate the efficiency of this re reaction over here. And obviously you have at the numerator, all the output divided by the denominator where there are the inputs. And it's very important to have both numerator and denominator in energy units. And the efficiency of this process is usually between 70 and 90%. And calculating this efficiency, you have also sort of quality checks of the data that you, that you collected, whether they are correct or there is some part missing. Now let's look at the iron and steel sector because that's very relevant. Many coal products are used in this sector, but also many processes are involved and pertain to different flows in the coal balance. So it's very important to differentiate and classify them correctly. We have transformation flows where fuels, uh, coal fuels are transformed into another energy form or another uh, coal product, a derived product. We have energy industry on use fuels, uh, sorry, flows, where fuels are consumed to support operation. This uh, iron seed is a very energy intensive uh, industry. And so a lot of energy uh, is used to support the operation. And sometimes it comes from the coal products, uh, which are, uh, for example, created and so on. And then we have final consumption, that it's the fuel consumed in all the operation downstream to, for example, coke ovens, blast furnaces, and they, um, all these uh, operation where we have final consumption of coal, they are listed into the international standard for industrial classification. So moving on, this is a simplified flow chart of the iron and steel industry. I will not go through all of it because it's long, but you can see coke ovens here, blast furnaces, and then further downstream other, um, other um, processes where mostly non-energy products, for example, pig iron, are, um, are used. So if we, we already saw coke oven, so let's look maybe at the blast furnace, and we see that coke oven coke is an energy product, and it's a transformation input. We see the blue arrow into the blast furnace, together sometime with the bituminous coal, which is used in pulverized coal injection to improve the efficiency of the transformation. And uh, also iron ore, which is not an energy product, so we will not collect that in coal statistics. And the output in terms of energy products is blast furnace gas of this process. And blast furnace gas can be further used in the blast furnace for energy industry use, or sometimes if the if coke ovens is also placed in the same con uh, complex also in coke ovens. And uh, pig iron is the outcome of this transformation, but it's not an energy product, and therefore it's not uh, collected by the statistics. So these are uh, the energy products. Uh, they usually the efficiency of these transformation processes. And uh, for iron and steel industry, we have that uh, all the flows pertaining to the IC group 241 then will be uh, um, included into iron and steel final consumption. Moving on to data reporting, um, let's uh, let's be quick on that. You would see those also in other uh, questionnaire. We have several ways of uh, collecting data and several sources. For example, surveys that can be done and interact with the many players, mining companies on the supply side, enterprises like power plants operator, iron and steel companies, and so on on the demand side, as well as households. Not very common for coal, but that could be the case. And then we have all the administrative data, which are collected for administrative reasons from ministries, uh, energy regulators, uh, administrative offices, among which, for example, custom office, which are usually a very good source of raw uh, data for trade. 
Then we have uh, direct measurements, calorific value, very important. We will see them later in this presentation and in the exercises. Other sources as international organizations, coal association, for example, and then estimation and modeling when uh, we are not able to collect the data first hand, but we can collect activity data or other data figure on production from which we can estimate blast furnace gas production. Um, moving to the annual questionnaire, this is the, the questionnaire that the IA we use to collect data from uh, the countries that, uh, that work with us. And some of you obviously are familiar with that, but for all the others, I want to work you through, through it. So there are four tables starting from this one. The first one is the flow table. We will see that later in detail, but it's supply and demand flows of the cold balance. Then imports and export table, imports by origin and export by destination, and the calorific value table. In addition, we have one table for each product with the time series of each, uh, of each flow. So moving from the first one, now you see it a bit little, so let's try to, to zoom. We have uh, products in the column dimension and flows in uh, the row dimension. So basically every column is a commodity balance in physical units for a given product. And we have first the supply block, then the transformation block, and then energy sector, industry, and final consumption. And you see in uh, yellow, uh, the values, the new values. So all the new values for the new year, or when there is a revision in our questionnaire, the formatting will show uh, a new value, uh, we show a yellow value compared to the pre-filled one. Then uh, uh, tables two and three, imports and exports. Uh, what I want to show you here is the fact that if you don't know the country of uh, origin of uh, some imports or the country of destination of some exports, there is the possibility of put them in the not elsewhere specified uh, uh, row for both tables. And then very importantly, the, the table on uh, calorific value, where you have uh, calorific value collected by use and by product, obviously, in gross and net terms, very important. They are, corrected, they are collected also by use for seven flows, because it's possible that, for example, a, um, a production of a certain type of coal differs, for, for example, in calorific value from imported quantities from another country, and then in, uh, in the uses uh, downstream on the demand side, they will be used accordingly, for example, to the calorific value or chemical product, properties or so on. Now, moving towards uh, the conclusion, we still uh, look at, um, this is the, the product table of other binomial school. It's an example of one of the 17 product tables. And basically here we have, uh, all first all the flows, then the calorific value, then imports and exports. So it's a concentrate of all the tables we saw before, but for one product and with the time series. Remarks page at the end, just to provide additional information about complicated, complicated or specific processes or situation for, for your country. And this is the menu sheet where you can select uh, the year to um, to check the data, for example. You can do here imports and export in CFV, but also check the data with this button over here and you select the year and you see some automatic arithmetical and consistency checks. So towards the end, uh, a conclusion about that is the fact that consistency is very important in the questionnaire uh, with the questionnaire, so intra-questionnaire or within the questionnaire with other with other statistics. Um, in terms of within the questionnaire, an example is between table one and table two, all the imports by origin, the sum should be the same as in table one of total imports. Or for example, in table one, we should have consistency in terms of efficiency, for example, for cocovens, the efficiency of a cocoven should be, shouldn't be above 100%. In the questionnaire, for example, with the electricity, for the electricity and heat generation, we have to report the same quantity in physical terms, but also in energy terms. So it's very important also the calorific values collected in table four for main activity producer to be consistent with the one in the electricity and heat questionnaire. And finally, if you wanna learn more about energy statistics, you, have, you can click here and have the energy statistic manual from the IA 
available in 10 languages. Obviously, that's consistent with the United Nations International Recommendation for Energy Statistics, which is the most important guideline for energy statistics. It was conceived by several international organizations, uh, among which the IA. And then IA uh, statistic website, questionnaires and reporting instruction available on the website. And many more other data services, products, reports for which the data that we produce here and that we are presenting to you, the, the methodology are the foundation to all the uh, several reports within the agency. So thank you very much.